ಶ್ರೀ ಗುರುಭ್ಯೋ ನಮಃ ಸದಾ ಶಿವ ಸಮಾರಂಭ ಶಂಕರಾಚಾರ್ಯ ಮಧ್ಯ ಮಾಂ ಅಸ್ಮದಾಚಾರ್ಯ ಪರ್ಯಂತ ವಂದೇ ಗುರು ಪರಂಪರಾಂ ಈಶ್ವರೋ ಗುರುರಾತ್ಮೇತಿ ಮೂರ್ತಿ ಭೇದ ವಿಭಾಗಿನೆ ವ್ಯೋಮವತ್ ವ್ಯಾಪ್ತ ದೇಹಾಯ ಶ್ರೀ ದಕ್ಷಿಣಾಮೂರ್ತ ನಮಃ ಭಾರತೀ ಕರುಣಾಪಾತ್ರ ಭಾರತೀ ಪದಭೂಷಣ ಭಾರತೀ ಪದಮಾರೌಢ ಭಾರತೀ ತೀರ್ಥಮಾಶ್ರಯ ವಿದ್ಯಾಭಿನಯ ಸಂಪನ್ನ ಪೀತರಾಗಂ ವಿವೇಕಿನ ವಂದೇ ವೇದಾಂತ ತತ್ವಜ್ಞ ವಿದುಶೇಖರ ಭಾರತೀ ನಮಸ್ತೆ ಎವ್ರಿವನ್ ವಿ ಆರ್ ವೆರಿ ಹ್ಯಾಪಿ ಟು ಬ್ರಿಂಗ್ ಟು ಯು ಎಟ್ ಅನದರ್ ಸೆಷನ್ ಆಫ್ ಕಾನ್ವರ್ಸೇಷನ್ಸ್ ಆನ್ ಕಾನ್ಷಿಯಸ್ನೆಸ್ ದಿಸ್ ಇಸ್ ನಿತಿನ್ ಶ್ರೀಧರ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಅದ್ವೈತ ಅಕಾಡೆಮಿ ಅಂಡ್ ಟುಡೇ ವಿ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಎ ವೆರಿ ಸ್ಪೆಷಲ್ ಗೆಸ್ಟ್ ವಿತ್ ಅಸ್ ಮಹಾ ಮಹೋಪಾಧ್ಯಾಯ ಸ್ವಾಮಿ ತತ್ವವಿಧಾನಂದ ಜಿ ಹೂ ಇಸ್ ಜಾಯ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಅಸ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಹೈದರಾಬಾದ್ ವೆರಿ ವಾರ್ಮ್ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಟು ಯು ಸ್ವಾಮಿ ಜಿ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ಫಾರ್ ಅಗ್ರೀಂಗ್ ಫಾರ್ ದಿಸ್ ಇಂಟರ್ವ್ಯೂ ಟು ಗಿವ್ ಎ ಬ್ರೀಫ್ ಇಂಟ್ರೊಡಕ್ಷನ್ ಸ್ವಾಮೀಜಿ ಇಸ್ ಎ ಪಂಡಿತ ಅಂಡ್ ಸ್ಕಾಲರ್ ಇನ್ ಬೋತ್ ಅ ಕ್ಲಾಸಿಕಲ್ ಟ್ರೆಡಿಷನಲ್ ಸೆನ್ಸ್ ಆಸ್ ವೆಲ್ ಆಸ್ ಇನ್ ಅ ಮಾಡರ್ನ್ ಸೆನ್ಸ್ ಹಿ ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಟೆಡ್ ಹಿಸ್ ವೇದಿಕ್ ಸ್ಟಡೀಸ್ ಇನ್ ಚೈಲ್ಡ್ಹುಡ್ ಅಂಡರ್ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಅಂಡರ್ ಹಿಯರ್ ಟ್ಯುಟಿಲೇಜ್ ಆಫ್ ಹಿಸ್ ಫಾದರ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಲೇಟರ್ ಇನ್ ಎ ಟ್ರೆಡಿಷನಲ್ ಪಾಠಶಾಲ ಲೇಟರ್ ಹಿ ಆಲ್ಸೋ ವೆಂಟ್ ಇನ್ ಟು ಮಾಡರ್ನ್ ಅಕಾಡೆಮಿಕ್ ಸ್ಟಡೀಸ್ ಹಿ ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ಎ ಪಿ ಎಚ್ ಡಿ ಇನ್ ಕೆಮಿಸ್ಟ್ರಿ ಅಂಡ್ ಎಂಜಾಯ್ಡ್ ಎ ಸಕ್ಸಸ್ಫುಲ್ ಸೈಂಟಿಫಿಕ್ ಕೆರಿಯರ್ and from there swami ji developed interest got back and he did a uh, phd dissertation on veda and he won a gold medal uh, for it and uh, then swami ji met his uh, guru puja swami ji uh, the shri dayananda saraswati ji and under him and under him he did a very intense uh, study and sadhana of uh, vedanta of bhagavad gita and other texts of vedanta Uh, swami ji is uh, currently the vice uh, president of asha vidya gurukulam uh, sailors book and he has written more than 70 books on vedanta in english sanskrit and as well as telugu uh, he is a epitome of a combination of both vidya and vinaya and we are very fortunate uh, to be ha- to have this opportunity to interview the swami ji uh, again a warm welcome to you swami ji Oh. oh thank you for your kind words uh, swami ji i want to start with uh, first question would be i know uh, it is considered one should not speak about the purvashrama uh, with a sanyasi uh, however my question is uh, um, how did swami ji develop an interest in vedanta i mean how did his spiritual journey start uh, from his childhood Okay, I don't think there is any such taboo. You can mention about the Purvashrama. Um, you see, uh, there was Vedanta in the family uh, since childhood itself. My father was a Brahmavidya Mohdati. He is no more a Brahmavidya Vishadha and Mahamhupadhyaya too uh, in Vedanta, in Advaita Vedanta. And, uh, Uh, it is not an exaggeration to say that many of the traditional Vedanta scholars of uh, this uh, generation have uh, uh, their uh, studies under his guidance, most of them. Uh, so, therefore, there was Vedanta at home. There were always uh, students uh, studying with him and he was uh, uh, teaching Vedanta uh, at home and also in a Pathashala where he worked. And uh, therefore, It is only natural that some of it has a problem to me also. And so that is how I developed interest in Vedanta. Uh, because of uh, uh, a context, because of uh, the environment, entirely because of that, uh, they, they, there is no personal credit in it. And uh, uh, having said that, I can say, uh, kind of I was uh, studying Vedanta, Uh, at a very early age of uh, teenage itself. So that was the advantage of uh, uh, taking Partha in such a family. So that is how the interest in Vedanta developed very naturally. 
I, it's not that uh, I understood that I have developed interest, etc. I was not subconscious about any particular interest in Vedanta, etc. It's happened so naturally. And therefore, I cannot even clearly say that I have developed interest. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful, uh, Swamiji. Uh, can you share with us more about your uh, um, meeting of uh, Pooja Swamiji, Dayananda Saraswati Ji, and uh, uh, how did it happen and how did it uh, uh, kind of uh, influenced you and uh, your life journey? I was studying uh, Veda with a Vedic uh, scholar, Sri Kumpala Kameshwara Khanapati, and then I was studying Sanskrit uh, language literature. And the grammar, etc., under the guidance of the great scholar Sri Kumkala Subraya Shastri. And then I was studying Vedanta, Prasthanatraya, uh, most of it, almost all of it, under the guidance of my father. Therefore, this study was going on. This multifaceted study was going on, and uh, I, I grew into uh, from teenage into 20s and then into 30s, I stepped into 30s. Uh, while all the while the study was going on. Uh, but uh, what happened is, uh, in the orthodox circles, they do speak of Sarvam Kalvedam Brahma, etc. They do say uh, that Atma is one and uh, uh, God is in every human heart, etc. Such lofty statements they do make. Uh, as part of their teachings and study, etc. But in life, you don't see any of that. In, in fact, in life, you see the opposite of it. There is a tremendous uh, contradiction, uh, no, knowingly or unknowingly, that th this did not happen uh, with uh, me or with a few Mahatmas of that names I have mentioned. This happened over millennia in the Hindu society. Uh, as even Swami Vivekananda pointed out, that uh, when we go to Upanishads and the Bhagavad Gita, we present uh, some of the loftiest principles of uh, oneness of the entire humanity. But at the same time, we treat uh, one of our own Hindu as a lowly creature. So this kind of a tremendous contradiction was pointed out by even Swami Vivekananda. And it was there in my mind all the time, this contradiction. And then uh, suddenly one day I met the Buddha Swamiji unexpectedly. In fact, I was, uh, I met a Swami Chinmayananda to begin with. And I was attending some of his classes. I was attracted uh, into this uh, uh, teaching of uh, Vedanta by Chinmayananda in English. Till then I have studied the entire Vedanta in Sanskrit and in vernacular Telugu. But now it is getting, uh, it, is, it, is, uh, it is being presented in English. And uh, so, and even the vision is uh, somewhat new. It is more uh, practical and more connected to life than bookish. Uh, so that is how I felt. And then, uh, so I was very much uh, attracted to Swami Chinmayanandaji Maharaj's teachings. And then in the process, Swami Dayanandaji Maharaj was also part and parcel of Chinmaya Mission in those days. And so I was exposed to Swamiji's teachings also, Kujya Swamiji's teachings. And then unexpectedly, I happened to visit Anaikati when Kujya Swamiji was teaching a course of Vedanta. Uh, I think by then, uh, Chinmaya Anandaji was no more. And I was in Anaikati. There I have seen the class in which which Swamiji was teaching uh, the Bhashya, Upanishad Bhashya and Gita Bhashya. And uh, I looked around at the students, uh, some 70, 75 students were there. They were all from all castes, creeds, religions, regions of India, and also from different countries of the world. That is where I thought to myself, here I see Sarvatma Bhava in operation. What I was studying all along in Upanishads and Gita, etc., in the books only it was there as a concept. But then uh, it is no more a concept, it is a, um, present in the life situation in a classroom where a Mahatma was teaching Prasthanatari Vashyas to all the people. If this crowd was presented before the orthodox scholars 
or some of these pithapatis, etc., they would consider it a blasphemy to teach anything to this crowd. That kind of a contrast I could see. And so I was very much uh, impressed by that Sarvatma Bhava, which I noticed uh, in the teachings of Kutya Swamiji. And therefore, I have stepped out of orthodoxy that day. I was born and brought up in a deep orthodoxical systems in life, uh, into teenage and into twenties also. But uh, by the time I reached uh, 25, 30, I did not uh, exactly note the time. In some some time at that time, in that in that path of life, I stepped out of orthodoxy. May not be suddenly, maybe gradually. And uh, now I am into Sarvatma Bhava. That is how it happened. I, I did not know your question was exactly answered that way. I said something. Okay, please proceed. Thank you, Swamiji. The, uh, that was a one, very wonderful down to earth perspective. Mm. Uh, uh, when did you, I mean, uh, uh, not everybody is able to take sannyasa. Not just that people do not have the competency or inclination, I mean, it is also a very difficult decision. I mean, so. Uh, uh, how did when did you decide to take sanya the path of sanyasa and not the path of grahastashrama and what were the uh, factors that led you to those de decisions? Dear young man, so I will be glad to answer your question and uh, I appeal to the audience also. Um, I, I do have an appeal to make to your audience wherever you are going to present this uh, recording. The question is a uh, file, but uh, the answer, not only for this question, for some of the questions that will ensue, the answer may not be conventional. The answer may be uh, a bit unconventional, uh, and therefore I request you to have an open mind. Uh, so, you see, I never looked at this is a nyasa thing as something that I have done. And therefore, your question I am not going to answer in any conventional manner. I did not take to sannyasa. Sannyasa happened. I may sound a bit, uh, a bit unusual. And uh, if uh, someone construes uh, that I am uh, posturing, I cannot help it. I can only tell you, I am not posturing, I am telling you wholeheartedly, uh, I am telling the truth from in the heart, namely, uh, I did not uh, so much plan undertake sannyasa. Of course, I did purchase the railway ticket, I did uh, book uh, the reservation, I did uh, travel to the play, to Rishikesh, all that I have done. Uh, therefore, some activity of that kind is there, which you can call personal. Uh, but really speaking, it all happened. Uh, there were uh, so many circumstances that have fallen in place which have uh, removed this uh, Swami from the family life and made him into a Swami, a sannyasi from time morning in Rishikesh. It all happened. And uh, uh, even today, even from a distance of two and a half uh, decades, when I look at it, I do not feel that uh, as something that I have done. Uh, that's why I never say I have taken to sannyasa. Probably I did not make such a statement knowingly. Uh, so it so happened uh, that uh, all these factors, factors of the family, uh, factors connected to the personality traits, various factors uh, that, uh, that have fallen in place, the Guru's uh, kindness, and uh, then uh, there is a higher power that drives our lives. We are like so much, so many puppets in the hands of that uh, prime mover. So, so many of those things have fallen in place. And uh, uh, even to my own utter surprise, I became, uh, I ended up as a Swami with Kashaya uh, on the body uh, one fine morning in the Rishikesh. I never had any plan what to do after sannyasa, etc. I did not plan anything. It was all, uh, if there is one thing which can be called as spontaneous, I, I would call that as spontaneous. Yeah. 
So I have already answered it. Thank you so much. Uh -huh. Yes, yes, definitely. I think you also answered uh, another question is uh, that uh, sannyasa has to be truly spontaneous activity. I mean, it cannot be forced, it cannot be imposed. It, it, it has to come spontaneously, only then it's a true sannyasa. <laughs> Very nice. Puja Swami used to say, uh, when it does not matter anymore when you take sannyasa or not, that is when you should take sannyasa. He used to say like that. So it is a very, very profound statement, maybe a somewhat enigmatic statement also. So these things will happen rather than we doing those things. These are major turn, turns in life, you know. They do not happen by our volition. They happen uh, by the design, if you can say so, of the prime mover, which is another name for God. Swamiji, uh, you have been teaching Vedanta for, I think, uh, three days, two and a half, three decades now. Mm -hmm. So, uh, for a, uh, what are some of the Granthas, uh, very basic Granthas that you as a teacher value and prefer uh, it as a primer for the Shishyas, especially the uh, new entrants into Vedanta, new people who have just started discovering Vedanta. So, uh, what are the some of the texts that you suggest to them or you prefer teaching them to your own uh, students, new students. Okay. Very nice question. Huh? But then don't expect a conventional answer from me. So be prepared. <laughs> uh, uh, please uh, do have an open mind. I appeal to the audience also. You see, uh, I have seen many students studying Vedanta. Uh, I have seen them. I have, I have talked to many of those students and I have seen the teaching happening. Uh, I have traveled widely in India as well as outside India, Europe and North America, etc. And uh, wherever I go, I go to a place of Vedanta teaching and I don't go to any other place. Therefore, I was with this Vedanta teaching for the last three decades, as you correctly mentioned. And you may add one more decade to that. In fact, for four decades. So, because even before taking to Sanyas, I was teaching Vedanta. And uh, so, um, what I notice, uh, what I suggest is a direct answer to your question. Now I am going to the answer to the question. The students, they start with the Tatma Bodha. Uh, so I am coming to the answer from the negative side. Okay. So from the negative side, I will come to the positive. So my students start the Tatma Bodha because the Acharyas start the Tatma Bodha. That is how they start. The moment they the student is trained in Tattva Bodha. Now a thing happens. This is how I feel. Uh, people should listen with an open mind and not try to understand. I am not uh, criticizing anything. It is a critique, of course. Uh, so by the time the student completes the study of Tattva Bodha as taught by an Acharya, this student is now caught in the web of uh, conceptual Vedanta. There is such a thing. Uh, in fact, uh, there is only such a thing. Very rarely you come across Vedanta, which crosses the boundaries of concepts and ideas. The conceptual and ideational Vedanta boundaries. By crossing those boundaries, coming into real life, which can be called Vedantic life, very rarely you come across uh, such a situation, whether it is uh, the students or the Acharyas. By the time Tattva Bodha is complete, I don't have anything against Tattva Bodha. Uh, how can I have a, an opinion opposed to a text? But the way the text was taught uh, by the Acharyas, now the students are caught in the web of conceptual Vedanta means Vedanta has uh, so many words, so many phrases and expressions. It is all a very, very elaborate, intricate web of words, phrases and expressions which are mutually dependent, interdependent and inter-nourishing. One expression nourishes another expression, thereby creating a very attractive, beautiful, lovable, a web world of Vedantic concepts. 
no wisdom anywhere. People remain uh, victims of uh, intense uh, raga and pressure, attachment and aversion. There, there, there is no inner transformation. There, there is no, in, uh, there is no any such thing called antaranga vikasa, that inner transformation. There is no thought consciousness. In spite of talking so much about Brahma, whole day you talk of Brahma, but then uh, like that, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year without having a, even a hint of God consciousness. This kind of an enormous anomaly is put in place by the time Tattvamodha is completed. Therefore, if I have to teach a student, I keep Tattvamodha aside. I will start with Atma Bodha. I recommend that Atma Bodha is the primer. The primer. I, I even appeal to the Acharyas of Vedanta to first teach Atma Bodha. And let uh, first teach Atma Anatma Viveka. Start there, Viveka Prakriya. Start there. And uh, let the student undergo a very rigorous study of uh, Atma Anatma Viveka. Then he can come to Sarvatma Bhava. So therefore, the first primer that I would recommend is Atma Bodha. I sincerely feel that there is no text like Atma Bodha in the entire Vedantic literature. Shankaracharya's glory, you can see all of it in Atma Bodha. That, that I recommend first. Second, Bhagavad Gita with Shankara Bhashya. A trend has developed in the Vedantic teaching. You ask me a simple question, I am answering in a very elaborate way. Please bear with me. A trend has developed in Vedantic teaching as far as I could see. Um, uh, the trend is uh, teach Gita without going into the Fasya. Just read the verse and go on explaining it. And uh, uh, so, a, a person who studied Gita from the West, one of the Western Indologists, he said that Gita is a bunch of contradictions. That is his exact expression. Because when you don't uh, keep Fasya uh, before you, and uh, there is no proper Sangati between one Adhyaya and another Adhyaya, Sangati is connectedness between one verse and another verse. The connectedness is missing. Then in one Adhyaya, all glory about karma. In another Adhyaya, it is all about the renunciation of karma. And in one place it is bhakti, in another place it is jnana. And the Acharyas and the students all put together are under the impression that there are three watertight compartments called karma, bhakti and jnana. And the Sri Krishna seems to have said everything about everything of all the three. And that is the impression you get from those verses. That is how they teach Vedanta. So if you are studying Gita in the sixth month, if you are in the study of Gita in the sixth month, you should have completely put aside what you have learned in the second month or third month. Then only it makes sense. That is how it ends up. And therefore, sometimes I wonder what is what this Western Indologist said there. The Gita is a bunch of contradictions. It sounds uh, a bit meaningful at the, uh, superficially. Uh, therefore, uh, the Acharyas of Vedanta, first, they should uh, be humble. They should learn Gita. They should study Shankar Fashya carefully. And uh, they should not uh, look at the Shankar Fashya as uh, something, uh, um, Gita Fashya as something not very important. One Acharya was saying, I heard it and I was stunned. He said, what is there in the Gita Bhashya? Advesta, Advesta. It is there really. Advesta, Sarva Bhutana, if you go to the Bhashya, not Advesta, Advesta, Naitat Purusha. That is what Gita Bhashya is. That is what the Acharya says, who is teaching Vedanta for uh, many years. And uh, once I was discussing with my father about the Gita Prasthana Kraya Bhashya, he asked me, which is the most difficult bhashya among the prasthana praya. I was thinking and thinking and thinking. Uh, I did not even consider Gita. I was uh, examining Brahma Sutra bhashya versus uh, as a Mandukya bhashya, like that I was examining to answer. Finally, I answered Brahma Sutra. He said, you are wrong. Gita bhashya is the most difficult bhashya. Therefore, the, I am rather addressing the acharyas. You you don't explain a Gita verse 
through the prism of your own concepts and ideas. You be humble and explain Gita verse with the help of Shankaracharya, Shankara worship, at least in the beginning. Therefore, the, the answer to that question, so I have arrived at the answer after some of that negation and all that. So now I am coming to the answer. The second text which I recommend for the students of Vedanta, in fact, I recommend it to the Acharyas also in the same breath that they should teach Gita with the Shankara Bhashyam. They should stop interpreting Gita according to their own whims and fancies. They should not try to create a personal cult out of the Gita. They have to be humble. You teach Gita without your signature on it. It is a universal vision. And Shankara puts the entire Sangati in the perfect place. You stop putting your signature on Gita. Be humble. Don't claim yourself to be Acharya and Guru, etc. You are not a Guru, you are not an Acharya. You are uh, trying to share uh, the vision of Shankara and Sri Krishna with uh, the other people. Be one with them. Don't sit on a higher pedestal called Guru and start giving uh, your own version of Gita by putting your signature on it. Therefore, so I have answered your question more elaborately than how do you expect it or require it no, I, I, I expect, I love an elaborate answer because that, yeah. that helps to give so clarity. The answer by saying that Gita with Bhashyam, without putting our personal traits and imaginations and concepts into it, clean, clean you study Gita Bhashyam and present it before the people. If you want any help, uh, I recommend the Acharyas to, the, to study Belvakunda Ramaraya Kavi's commentary. These are the two texts I am suggesting as primers for the students of Vedanta. Uh, Ramaraya Kavi's commentary, is it on Shankara Bhashya on Gita? Yeah, it is only on Shankara Bhashya, not on Gita. Like Madhusudana okay. Saraswati's commentary is on Gita. Nothing to do with Bhashya. Whereas uh, uh, Ramaraya Kavi's commentary is not on Gita, it is on Bhashya. It is called Bhashyatka Prakasha. If necessary, one can take support from that commentary and so teach Gita verse with the help of Shankar Bhashya, that is enough. If you need assistance in understanding Shankar Bhashya, you rely upon Velakunda Ramaraya Kavi's uh, Yakshama. That is enough. For students and for Acharyas, this is enough. Swamiji, what is your uh, uh, opinion on Madhusudana Saraswati's Buddhartha Deepika? I did not pay much attention to it. It is a great text. It is a more, uh, uh, more scholastic than touching the heart. I am not able to comment one way or the other about Madhusudana Saraswati. I did not pay much attention to it. I have seen it briefly. I, I am an apprentice of Bhashya and Galapanda. Uh, Swamiji, I want to uh, take uh, take up few questions uh, on some of the uh, very basic uh, uh, conceptual misunderstanding uh, about Vedanta among the people, among many students, as well as non-students as well. Uh, so I would next few questions I would be focusing mm -hmm. on that. Okay. So one of the most important uh, one of the important concept, uh, uh, not just the Vedantic, but even in a general life, is that. Uh, the so-called dichotomy between the fate and free will. That there is a great debate, you know. Prarabdha versus and, Purusharta. Fate and, fate and free will. Free will and fate. Prarabdha and Purusharta. And okay. Yes. So can you uh, clarify what is the Vedantic uh, uh, understanding or approach to this uh, dichotomy? I was waiting for that question <laughs> because uh, there there will not be any success without that question. <laughs> Okay, so now you have arrived at that question like anybody else, uh, probably of this kind of context. Nice, I'm not saying anything against you. Welcome, you are welcome to the You don't expect a conventional answer from this is probably, okay? <laughs> First of all, the words of hatred and free will, would you care to translate them into Sanskrit before me so that I can answer? Anyway, you think about it. Okay. I think uh, so, uh, 
no, no, I, I think i would prefer a, uh, you know the mutual function of prarabdha and uh, purushartha but they have, oh, you have so many words okay so you would call fate as prarabdha i mean the, I, don't, uh, i don't know because these are never western concepts yes definitely and they are not uh, in vedanta the word free will has no counterpart in vedanta it came from western philosophy some of our acharyas they went to europe and america and brought it back and they tried to push it into vedanta that's why i say study gita properly i'm not saying you students alone okay <laughs> so i have the audacity to address the entire vedanta community please don't mind so there is no corresponding word to free will in sanskrit and vedanta literature so i was struggling to translate this word free will the nearest that comes in the gita the nearest that comes to free will is the sense of leadership kartrutva okay that is all we talk about the sense of leadership so so now the question is between fate and the sense of leadership that is the question we have to look at it like that now you see uh, gita categorically says the sense of leadership is wrong ahankara vimuha prakrute kriyamanani gunai karmani sarvashah ahankara vimuhaatma kartahamuti manyate divo whosoever believes i am the doer he is a deluded person vimuha means deluded moha is a deluded very much a deluded by ahankara the sense of me and my that is the ahankara so there is the sense of me and mine in the human mind are very strongly entrenched there in the brain cells and that is called ahankara associated with mamakara also and that deludes us so completely that we end up saying that i am the doer therefore if you study gita properly the first thing that you learn is that you are not the doer in, in fact i appeal or i submit to the acharyas of vedanta what are you thinking what, what is your idea of atma gyan what is atma gyan you tell me what is atma gyan self knowledge what is the self knowledge so they they give some concepts about self knowledge atma is this atma is that not like that you don't you don't arrive at self knowledge through concepts you arrive at self knowledge through negation so shri krishna says in gita ya pashyati tatha atmanam akarta sa pashyati that is the chapter of gita second line so whosoever sees that he is not the doer he alone sees that is the atma you know what is the self knowledge please take it from me the self knowledge is knowledge of the self which is not the doer when self is not the doer then the self is no more me it has no more mind that self in which egoity has no place at all the egoity is completely wiped out that is the true self that is called atma jnana therefore where is the question of free will and all that you you don't have you means not you mr abhinand so that is the style of speaking you don't have a free will you only have an illusion of free will there is no free will okay suppose uh, um you see one day i was taking a class gita class from such bars a physics professor was there and uh, he attended the class and uh, while i was coming out of the class he followed me and said i, I have a question can i ask you he said please go ahead so he is a professor of physics he said uh, you see You you mean to say that I did not come to your class by my free will? I sat there one hour and listened to you. There was no free will at all in that. So that is how he asked me. I came here by driving one hour to attend your class. You mean to say there is no free will involved at all? That was the answer question he asked me. Then I told him, Doctor, you know physics. There is a thing called paradigm. In one paradigm, it is your free will. And you are the doer. 
privileged worship, you know. But uh, that is not Gita's paradigm. That is not Vedantic paradigm. That is worldly paradigm. And so, there is a different paradigm. And I am teaching from that paradigm. And then in that paradigm, you are not in here. You are not responsible for what all happened to your body-mind. In fact, it is not your body-mind. Do you know that? Therefore, if the body-mind is not yours, then what kind of a dear you are? Therefore, it's a different paradigm. I told him, you are asking a question from Newton paradigm while I am teaching Einstein paradigm. <laughs> that is where the dichotomy has come. Therefore, I answer, there is no doership on our part. Whatever happens in the body through the organs of action happens by thought. All action originates in the thought. Thought is the originator or origin of every single action and speech. Speech is also action. And uh, all the three put together, the body, the organs of action, and different actions that these organs of action perform. And then, uh, then uh, the, the speech, the organ of speech, and then the thought, all of that, the entire thing is not the two, is not the self. It becomes the self only by wrong identification. Therefore, when I am speaking here with you, I am aware that I am not speaking. There is speaking, but I am not speaking. That, that is the vision. And uh, all the students of Vedanta have to rise to that vision. They have to rise to that uh, paradigm. It is something like uh, you join physics course. In the first semester, you study Newtonian physics, but you come out with a post graduation, you end up with Newtonian physics. No, you come to Einsteinian physics. And then you come out uh, as a postgraduate. Similarly, when you join Vedanta, in the Tatmabodha days, in the first one month, two months, maybe you talk of Karta, Bhakta, etc. But by the time you rise uh, to a higher level of understanding, the Karta, Bhakta is, uh, it has to be dismissed altogether. And you have to come to uh, a level of understanding where you are the witnessing awareness with reference to the body-mind, which is functioning according to the laws of nature. You know this? The body functions according to the laws of nature. The mind functions according to the laws of nature. The entire physiology and psychology are the, are the, are the uh, nature alone, are the products of nature alone. And the Atma is a Sangaha. So you are a witnessing awareness alone. Therefore, assuming that I have some free will, etc., it, it is a passion uh, among the, the Acharyas. Uh, who have some half-baked Vedantic study, who are interested only in the understand in the study of uh, conceptual Vedanta and imparting the same kind of conceptual Vedanta to the students. So this is a huge misconception. And uh, without your asking, I am adding one more thing. This identification of the Guru as Guru, I am the Guru, and you are all the Sishyas. So Sishya identifies himself as Sishya, and Guru identifies himself uh, as Guru, and the Guru is Guru, Sishya is Sishya. This kind of crystallized adamantine identifications of Guru and Sishya have originated from this false notion of worship. And therefore, as long as there is a Guru, the teacher, E-R, the Trich, and as long as there is a Sishya, the, the student who doesn't study properly, but he calls himself a Sishya. And so, as long as these adamantine uh, fixated identifications are in place, there is only conceptual Vedanta, there is no true Vedanta. There is learning of Vedanta only when there is no Guru and there is no Sishya. Now, I have put this doership to the Guru Sishya also. Sahendra Takshakaya Swaha. Therefore, did I answer your question? Yes, sir, Mishi, definitely. Okay. You, you, you did more than answer the question. Okay. <laughs> so, a, a related to what you just said, uh, I think uh, were two concepts with which people, especially the uh, seekers of Vedanta struggle with, is the notion of uh, the uh, Mithyatva, uh, Mithya and uh, Adhyasa. I mean, uh, these are the two, as you said, conceptual Vedanta. So, <laughs> Uh, these are the two concepts. Uh, I mean, the, the, that uh, you know, 
kind of it becomes difficult to reconcile with the reality that we see with our eyes and ears and uh, things so can you shed some light on these as well okay <laughs> you see what you see with your eyes what you hear with your ears is not real that you see is real that you hear is real not what you see and what you hear you imagine yourself sitting in a movie theater what all you see visual and what all you hear audio is unreal that you see the movie sitting there by paying uh, 10 rupees or 15 rupees or whatever <laughs> so i used to pay for and half an hour and i saw what all that you see is alone the truth you should understand me young man so you cannot give the logic that the reality that we are seeing is that is not the reality that is that is samsara we are students of vedanta including yourself and therefore um so you, i tell you the word mithya you have to understand correctly mitha bhavati iti mithya you see grame bhavah gramya vane bhavah vanya tat prachaya yaka prachaya so mithaha bhavati iti mithya that which happen relative to each other i give you a simple example you please uh, accept the example without bringing the entire physics into it when you look at the sunlight it is white and clear but when you look at the same sunlight through the prism it appears divided into seven colors only take that much example don't go into the entire spectroscopy of that okay so that much so to see seven colors you must have a prism intervening between you the one who sees and the sun the thing that you are looking at the prism must intervene in the absence of the prism it appears as one the sun pure white light similarly the sense organs and the mind together constitute a prism and you are looking through that prism and now what you see through the prism of the mind and sense organs the world you you should be able to say as a student of vedanta with an incisive understanding you should be able to say that the world i experience see is experience the world i experience is relative to the mind and the, the sense organs you should be able to say that you should not say the world that i experience is real it is not real it is not absolute it is only relative to the sense organs and the mind you just imagine minus sense organs and the mind do you ever experience the world never yad bhave yad bhavati yad abhave yad na bhavati without mind and sense organs there is no world i will i will ask you to contemplate on one statement when your mind develops sense organs sense organs are included in the mind i am dismissing sense organs also when your mind is perfectly still there is no waking state anymore therefore don't say that the world is real and all that the world is not real the world is experiential through some certain sense mind therefore i would uh, i would change my own expression the world is observational rupa and the linguistic nama that is what the world is when you look at the serpent the serpent is what you see observation the serpent is the name given to what you see linguistic the serpent is not what is not existential existential is something else therefore jagat the world is observational and linguistic you see the students of vedanta should not allow themselves to be taught in such kind of meaningless dichotomies or contradictions that the world is somewhat real somewhat unreal it is not like that. it is a superimposition through and through adhyasa therefore what you are looking at 
is not what you make out of it. Okay, therefore, Mithya, Mithaha Bhavati. You see, there is a mind, a cognitive mind, only when there is a cognized thing. And there is a cognized thing only when there is a cognitive mind. A dono, it is mutual. There is no mind without matter, and there is no matter without mind. Mind and matter come together, and they vanish together. They both are unreal. The real is beyond both mind and matter. This is the Vedanta. You have to study Adhyasa Bhashya properly. And the Acharya, it is not the problem with the students that much. It is the Acharyas which create all the confusion. They don't understand Mithya properly. They don't teach Mithya properly. You should go back to Shankara. And first you should examine Shankara's teaching. Maya, Mari, Chiraka, Gandharva, Nagara, Raju, Sarpa. Like that he gives, in a given Samasa, he gives half a dozen examples where you cannot miss the vision of Mitsa. Yet we end up missing the vision of Mitsa and convert the whole Vedanta into some, into some kind of a conceptual um, verbal thing. And, and therefore, um, so you have to first understand Mithya unreal. Mithya is unreal. Adhyasa, superimposition. You, you should not compromise on some of these things. And uh, you have to you have to always keep Raju Sattva example in your mind. Because I have a feeling in most of the contexts, the Acharyas as well as the students, in most of the contexts, I am telling you, I, I am Arashi to say this, the Acharyas and the students of the Vedanta in most of the contexts have not understood Murtika Ghatta example properly. They are misrepresenting it. They are uh, playing, they are beating around the bush. They don't, uh, they think separate. Some expressions I'm trying to search. Uh, therefore, uh, you stop all that. And uh, so, is there a difference between the Dusapa Bhakti and the Ghatta Muktika example? There is no difference. Both are one and the same. In, in Muktika and Ghatta example also, Ghatta is Vacharam Bhakti. It is linguistic. Ghatta is linguistic. Nama. It is a, a Namadhaya. We are name. And uh, what goes with the name? Rupa. That is the Vikara. Therefore, Raju Sattva, you have to understand properly. Without understanding properly Raju Sattva, giving a convenient to go by to the Raju Sattva and getting caught, by assuming, presuming that this Ghatta uh, and Muktika is somewhat different and giving a different kind of meaning to Mitya and bringing uh, some other kind of reality between real and unreal. All of this is a, a kind of uh, uh, going round and round uh, without arriving at the point at all. Thereby, in a way, there must be some vested interest in all this. In a way, we don't have the courage to say the world as unreal. We don't have the courage to see the false as false. And that's why we engage in this kind of uh, avoidance and, uh, and uh, affuscation, as you can say, so, so, confusion. And uh, so Swayam so confused. Param confused MT. So in such thing we engage. We should stop this and uh, understand uh, Adhyasa properly, study Adhyasa Bhashan properly, understand Mitya properly, Mithaha Bhavati. That is the Mitya. Mitya is not uh, saying it is not an ontological word. It, it is uh, it is not uh, you can it is Mithaha Bhavati, it is a relative situation only it is describing. Adhyasa is the ontological expression. Something is superimposed which is unreal and whatever is there as the locus of superimposition is the real and therefore we should have a proper understanding of all this and uh, we should stop confusing, obfuscating uh, between uh, real and unreal and we should stop introducing some kind of intermediary things uh, because of some Western interest in the world. Uh, 
uh, in the world or whatever. And uh, we should try to, we should go back to Shankara's vision. Shankara says, Rajvam Bhujangam Eva Ratibhasitam Vai. Just, just to hold on to Raju Sattva in your mind, in your heart, you will not make a mistake. The moment you give a go-boy to Raju Sattva and try to give some kind of a, some kind of a uh, logic to explain the Ghatta Muktika thing to suit your thinking, already you have uh, made a mistake. The Vedanta becomes a conceptual, it loses uh, its glory, it somehow tries to accommodate the world. If you want to accommodate the world, where do you want to Vedanta? Go to Upasana, go to Karma, and go to the Arthaka. Uh, Swamiji, uh, moving further, uh, you have been stressing throughout the session that the importance, the need to move beyond the conceptual Vedanta and into a, uh, what can be called perhaps a practical Vedanta, you know, that which leads to... So, uh, so my next question is, uh, uh, what are the qualities that a, uh, that a student of Vedanta must develop uh, to practically, uh, you know, internalize the teachings of Vedanta and uh, to develop the sadhana chatushtam, the viveka, vairagya, etc. and, you know, to have a transformation. Okay. Well, uh, we ask a question. We should not expect uh, the speaker to answer in a way that fits into our thinking. Uh, that's why when we ask a question, we should keep our mind empty, put aside all the knowledge that we have accumulated earlier, all this conceptual knowledge, and keep the mind open and empty. Then only you will be able to get something uh, out of any such effort. Then only what the speaker makes could make some sense. So, please bear with me. The student of Vedanta must have a few qualities, I will pinpoint them, must be earnest, that is number one, earnestness. You see, I come across the earnest students among the intermediate students who are working very hard to pass, in a, to secure a good rank, to get a seat in IIT or in some such a premier institute, these students of intermediate, I see a tremendous earnestness in them. But I don't see that in Vedanta students. It's okay, Vedanta students mean some Rohasthas come and study Vedanta. I don't expect that level of earnestness among them. It's all right, they have family people and all that. So I can understand that. But these brahmacharis who give up everything, they, 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 they sacrifice everything. They could become good engineers in Oracle or Infosys. All that they sacrifice. And uh, in, the, in the ripe uh, teenage, when they should be running behind some young beautiful ladies, young girls, they come to the Vedanta. Uh, and uh, some, some of the girls also come, and uh, uh, so they sacrifice so much, that is what I mean. And uh, they come, and uh, if you don't see earnestness in them, what a, what a misfortune it is. Why it so happened? Shall I answer that my own question myself? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Why it happened is, uh, they had a fire in them. You see, a person, uh, who has done MS, computer science, and uh, one Microsoft is willing to give him a marvelous job, uh, two lakh rupees per month, and he can have everything in, the, in this world. He can get married to a most beautiful young lady, and he can have a, an air-conditioned car, an air-conditioned bungalow, social status, everything he can have, but he gives up all of that and comes to study Vedanta. You look at the sacrifice he makes. There was so much fire in him on day one. And then he comes to a guru. This guru, what all he will do is, he will douse that fire within 30 years. So put him into Tattva Bodha or some such conceptual Vedanta. And then the gurus have some rituals going on side by side. What is the connection between rituals and Vedanta? 
Vedanta says you are not the karta. All this teaching that uh, you are not the karta is going on one side. And then uh, once the class is over, ahankara mudha atma karta ahamti mahamjate. So no me, no mine, like that, whatever you study. And then Acharya, some sishyas, all of them go to the ritual and participate in the ritual. And their mama, Ayushya, who shares them, who live long life, to perform the ritual. What is this contradiction? These Acharyas, the so-called Acharyas, have killed that fire in these Brahmacharyas. That fire has to be rekindled. Without that fire, you can never realize what it is here. You can only become one more conceptual Acharya, a professional Acharya. I remember a story told by Sri Ramakrishna, Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa. A student, there was a Vedanta teacher. A student went to him. Uh, Sir, I want to study Vedanta under your guidance. Then uh, the Acharya said, Do you want to be a, a Sishya or a student, a Vidyarthi, or do you want to be an Acharya? That is what the Acharya asked the student. You want to be a Vidyarthi or an Acharya? Then uh, the student, uh, he gave a thought to it. He, before answering, he said, I want the distinction between you two so that I can answer properly. Then the Acharya told her, if you are a Vidyarthi, you should be dead at nest. You should be use uh, uh, all uh, your energy, physical, psychological, and uh, all kinds of energy uh, for this study only. And you should become a tapasvi who is entirely devoted to this study, uh, who lives a very uh, simple life and uh, satisfied with the simple food, works very hard, uh, performs a great service to the Acharya and will do all household work and uh, he, he will uh, work very hard and uh, that is how a Vidyarthi is supposed to be. Oh, is it? Then how Acharya? Acharya means you become a professional person, you can teach Vedanta and etc. All Sishyas will come to you. You can teach them some uh, Brahma, Atma here and there. And then they will all bring uh, goodies to you, gifts to you, Pahara. You can eat some very good food. Eventually you will become diabetic, therefore there are uh, doctors etc. to do medicine also. So, and uh, the life will be very simple, very smooth. You will have social status. You can move around in an air conditioned Impala car. This is what an Acharya is. So then, you know, what is this? Is it? I want to become an Acharya. <laughs> then he said, okay, join a particular kind of course. You will become an Acharya. So would you get the spirit of the story, what I told? So they, they want to become Acharyas. They, they want to become Acharyas. Because they see the Acharya has all the benefits and advantages and perks and, um, of life like a Sijivo. Acharya is occupying a very favorable position and he wants to become Acharya and therefore he joins the course. This is the problem why the entire study of Kailanka has become conceptual and ideational and professional and therefore that is how we made it. Therefore, we get only professional teachers of Vedanta. They are in such a good number that uh, my turn for the central view came after five years because their number is so big. <laughs> okay. So by the time uh, I, I came into the picture, so much time has elapsed. I am in fact grateful that uh, I am appearing before you. So I is not the point. Uh, Therefore, the first quality that the students should have is that less that the fire they should that fire they should have to know the self, to know the truth, that fire they should have, number one. I think that is good enough. You can add some more qualities later, but I have answered your question adequately. That at less okay, I will add one more thing. In the absence of contradiction. You see, when you contradict yourself, you will never make any progress in life. Like, 
you want a good health, but you eat, you eat everything that spoils the health. That is the contradiction. In the family, you want peace and happiness, but you do everything, you say everything and do everything that destroys peace and happiness. This kind of self-contradiction is a most poisonous uh, obstacle in yoga. Yoga is knowledge, Vidyana. Therefore, students of Vedanta, and I say, I include, whenever you ask something about a student, I include Acharya. Because uh, the student, uh, by looking at the student, you can know something about the Acharya. Acharya has to guide the student. And if there are contradictions in the student, then uh, these contradictions are originating from the Acharya. You see, once uh, a young boy of 10 years old came to me and said he was already Upanayana was done. Please bear with me, two minutes. So he wanted to tell one or two mantras, uh, Uprasthana, etc. His parents encouraged him. He was saying, he was saying it wrongly, he was not pronouncing properly. And then uh, I asked him, okay, good, you have done a good job. Then I asked him, who taught him? Then the father told, I taught him. You are not the right person to teach him, you tell me. No, no, my son will tell. No, not your son, you tell me. Tell me, Mitrasya, Jirushana, Yitrutashtra, you started. He started, full of mistakes. Now I know why your son is making all mistakes. With him, you don't teach him anymore. Put him under a good uh, Vedic scholar. He will, because children will pronounce properly. Therefore, when I see a person pronouncing wrongly, I know where it is coming from. Okay? So, similarly, when I see these uh, tremendous contradictions among the students of Vedanta, I see that. I know why these contradictions are there, where from they are coming. They are coming from the Acharyas. The Acharyas of Vedanta. If they stop these contradictions, then the students will improve, will, will know better. For example, the Acharyas of Vedanta are promoting body worship. The first thing that we have to do in Vedanta is Atma Anatma Viveka, I am not the body. That is the first thing you should learn. The Acharya should first insist that I am not the body. Nachat Bhuta Sangha. The body is a conglomerate of the five elements. That is where the insistence should be there. What is the Acharyas of the Vedanta doing? I am appealing to the Acharyas of Vedanta. For God's sake, I prostrate and appeal to you. Stop. I stop glorifying the physical body. In the name of Pada Puja, in the name of Pushpa Puja, Pushpa Yaga, this Yaga, that Yaga, Ayushya Homa. Uh, so, Aisha Homa means what you want to live longer. Who has to live longer? The body. Are you the body? Therefore, when the Acharyas stop all these contradictions, they stop promoting the body worship, they stop, uh, uh, they, they pull the students into uh, this kind of uh, uh, unvedantic systems in the name of tradition. What do you mean by tradition? What you are doing is not Vedantic and you call it a tradition. Give it a sacred name so that you sanctify a uh, uh, not so sacred thing. So, this contradiction is the sign of weakness. Contradiction, self contradiction, is uh, very poisonous. It is the biggest obstacle for the knowledge of the self, and therefore, students should be free from that. That is the second qualification. I have answered your question partly. Thank you very much, uh, Swamiji. That was a very elaborate and very enlightening uh, uh, advice. Um, I have just one last question. I see that time is almost over as well. Yeah. So I just want to request you for any final advice, suggestion, guidance for genuine seekers. Any other advice you have? My advice to the seeker is you keep your mind open. Learning is not the same as accumulating knowledge. Like a calculus, you start with the differentiation, accumulation. 
first find the differentiation of sin theta, then cos theta, then tan. Swamiji, your screen is freezed. Uh, we can't hear you. Ten plus three plus two kind of thing it is. If it is ten plus three plus two, it will be a small part of life. Then what kind of Vedanta it is? Vedanta is life. In Vedanta, you do not accumulate knowledge. In Vedanta, you learn the truth. You do not accumulate the knowledge. So therefore, you might have uh, uh, you might have uh, put uh, all the texts of Vedanta into your head, into the brain cells. Yet in the heart, you are unhappy, you are jealous, you are uh, attached, you are averse. You are uh, fragmentary in your thinking, you are divisive in your thinking, and you are uh, a bag of bones in the heart. Whereas in the head, all knowledge is accumulated. Therefore, accumulation of knowledge is not Vedanta. Vedanta is learning. The difference between learning and uh, accumulation of knowledge is in learning, there is no accumulation. Learning doesn't accumulate. For example, as a child, I have learned that by putting the finger into fire, it will burn. I have learned it. It is not accumulation. It is learning. It is not accumulation. And Mahatma in Rishikesh used to say, these people, yes, Vedanta padte hai, Vedanta jante nahi. Do you see the difference between the two? Therefore, Vedanta is not accumulation of knowledge. It should not be converted into some kind of a 10 plus 3 plus 2 kind of thing. It is not a qualification to be acquired and flaunted before the public to gain some position of an acharya and all that. That is not Vedanta. Vedanta is you are aware of your body, your uh, mind, your actions, the movement in your consciousness from minute to minute, and you are aware of what is going on. And, uh, that awareness will bring a, a tremendous inner transformation within you. And that inner transformation, a radical inner transformation in your consciousness is called Vedanta. That is Vedanta. A transformation in which there is no mind, there is no me, there is only love, there is no fragmentary thinking, there is no divisive agenda. There is a Love for all, love of all. So, a vision in which I can embrace the entire humanity and the all life in this creation as my own self. That vision, you have to grow into that vision. That is Vedanta, not some accumulation of knowledge in the brain cells, embellish in the brain cells. This is what the students of Vedanta should understand. They should have a free mind. They should have an open mind. They should learn to think. The students of Vedanta nowadays, they stop to thinking in the name of tradition. Parampara bote. Acharya parampara. And then make up some verses and go on reading those verses. Parampara. What is parampara? A thought which was a frozen thousand years back. The frozen thought. It is carried from one head to the other head to the other head. That you call it parampara. And call it a tradition, call it sampradaya, and therefore you adopt it without even thinking it. Then you have surrendered thinking and, and uh, surrendered thinking in the name of tradition. That is not Vedanta. You have to regain your thinking faculty. You should think original. You should develop that intelligence. You need not, it is, Vedanta is not embellishment of intellect. Vedanta is awakening of that uh, original thinking that inner intelligence in which you see the false as false, the truth you yourself are. That is Vedanta. Thank you. Thank you, Swamiji, the, for uh, again and again highlighting the crux of 
Vedanta, what uh, speaker must actually focus on rather than on uh, getting mired in the conceptual uh, um, forest, uh, so to speak. Uh, and on the behalf of entire Advaita Academy, I want to again express our sincere gratitude that you have agreed to do this uh, interview and thank you for ca uh, coming on our program. Dear young man, my best wishes to you. I, I I thank you very much for putting up with me here for an hour. And so I did not remember one question where I have given a, a kind of expected answer. And so you have you are bearing with me. And uh, I thank uh, all other uh, um, fraternity and members of Advaita Academy. And uh, so I hope uh, Ishwara's grace. Uh, Ishwara's blessing is on uh, all, all of us by the uh, blessings of Ishwara. Uh, I pray that uh, we all live happily and that we all will know the truth of the self and be liberated. Om Harihi Om Tat Sat Shri Krishna Ramasthi.